Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Fresno Writers Live, uh, our latest installment of this online reading series to celebrate new books by Fresno Writers. Uh, this is our third of four readings this summer. Uh, so thank you very much for coming out, for being here. Tonight, we are here to spend some quality time together with Navdeep Singh Dillon and Aliyah Green and their excellent debut books of fiction. Uh, so I'm so glad that you're here tonight uh, in the Zoom space with us. My name is Jefferson Beavers, and I serve on the organizing committee of the Fresno State Creative Writing Alumni Chapter. I am very happy to welcome you to the Zoom space. Uh, and I would first like to acknowledge that this broadcast tonight originates from Fresno and California, the traditional homelands of the Yokuts and Mono peoples. So before we get started tonight, um, I wanted to take just a moment to um, make a note about uh, you know, a, a current event that's happened. It's a very sad event. I wanna take a moment to mark the passing of um, English faculty, Dr. Steve Adisa Smito Smith. Um, we, the four of us were talking before the reading and realized that um, Navdeep, Aliyah, and Gia all had Dr. Steve as a faculty member during their times in the MFA program. And I, of course, worked with Steve um, during my time as a staff. Um, if you have not heard, uh, Steve passed away this past weekend um, in a, a very tragic uh, drowning accident while he was on a family trip in Hawaii. Uh, Steve is, uh, was a wonderful um, professor of global literatures. Um, he taught courses in mythology, folklore, uh, eco-poetics, just an extraordinary uh, humanist and scholar and human being. Um, and we all, all four of us are impacted directly by him. And so I just wanted to take a moment tonight to acknowledge uh, Dr. Steve Adisa Smito Smith's passing. And maybe if we could take just a moment of silence uh, to remember Steve, um, we would like that very much. Thanks everybody. Okay, that's all my talking. Um, I would like to introduce you now to your host this evening uh, for this reading, Yia Lee. Uh, Yia is a Fresno State alumna with an MFA degree in fiction writing. She is a founding editor of Fresno State's student produced High Journal, uh, which is the Hmong American Ink and Stories Club's uh, journal. Spotlight us together there. And he is also a longtime member of the Hmong American Writer Circle. She teaches English and writing at both Fresno State and at UC Merced. And her work has been published in How Do I Begin, a Hmong Liter American Literary Anthology, as well as the magazines Sliver of Stone, The Normal School, and others. So it gives me a great pleasure, a great excitement to introduce you tonight to your host, Yia Lee. Um, thank you so much, Jefferson. Um, I appreciate, I want to say that I do appreciate all your work in organizing all this together. Um, so much thanks to you. And also thank you for uh, the moment of silence for Dr. Steve. Um, he is a big part of the Fresno State faculty and really did touch us all. So thank you for that too. Um, all right, so let me pull up this and then I will be um, introducing Aaliyah. Um, Sorry. Um, I have the honor of introducing Aaliyah Green, who is a native of Kentucky. She received her BA in English at Northern Kentucky University and her um, MFA in fiction at Fresno State University. A writer of speculative fiction and a practicing root worker, her stories work as a vehicle to navigate different types of generational trauma and often reflects the hidden rituals and folklore that permeates Black culture in the American South. The Bone Stay um, and other short stories is her debut collection of short stories. I also want to add that in my years at the Western State MFA program also overlapped with Aaliyah's time I remember the stories from her workshop being full of vibrant language, mystery, compelling spookiness and grief. 
The stories in her collection are the results of, hard, of a hardworking, talented writer who carefully crafted sinister and fairy tale like stories examining spirituality, womanly bonds, grief, racism, family identity. I am proud to introduce Aaliyah Green. Thank you. That's that was so wonderful of you to say here. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so the sto short story that I'm going to read from the collection is the Rincantation of La Nettle. Um, it's one of my favorites that I wrote, but it was also one of the hardest ones that I wrote as well. Um, I'm going to try to get through the, at least the first half, and if I have a little bit more time, I'll try to get through the rest. Um, so that, with that being said, here I go. Rue's hands hurt. They were achy and stiff and sore. She stared at herself in the dim lighting of the house's small bathroom. The wooden panels of the wall did nothing more but add an extra layer of darkness to the small space. She tried her best to bring light into the shadowy room by opening the blinds in the tiny window next to the sink. But the sun didn't, didn't hit the side of the house early in the morning. The water dripped off her as she stood out the bath, naked as the day she came out of her mama's out of her mama 16 years ago. She had been standing in front of the mirror for so long, her skin was almost dry. The water pooled in between the, the skin folds on her stomach. She looked, she always took extra time to make sure they were gone, or else her skin would fall off. At least that's what her granny told her. Some part of her hoped that it was true that her burnt skin would fall off and reveal pearly white skin. She stared at the, at the satin blue ribbon she took from the laundry basket yesterday when no one was looking. She, her mama, and her sister, Thelma, were up early yesterday morning doing most of the East Side's laundry. They normally spent Monday mornings before school hanging their helping their mama clean and hang laundry for the rich white folk in town. Rue hated it, but as her mama reminded her yesterday, if you like having a roof over your head, clothes on your back, and food in your mouth, you better be grateful that somebody needs their clothes washed. Her mama was so close in that moment that her breath added little droplets of sweat on Rue's cheek. Rue wiped the condensation from the water-laden air off the bathroom window. It was supposed to be overcast today but she looked up at the clear Georgia sky and sighed. Her edges had started to nap up from the beads of sweat that would form on her hairline. She was gonna get as black as asphalt this summer. On the other side of the wall, Thelma was still playing that new Nat King Cole record, Too Young. Rue was surprised she hadn't broken the damn thing yet. The ribbon was soft to the touch and she twirled it around her finger. Would it look beautiful on her? Rue could see herself work, working the makeup counter at Riches this summer, ribbon in her hair, matching the modern uniforms in black. No navy, red. She couldn't remember the color exactly. Her parents had only taken her there once during Christmas break. Either way, she could see it. She tried to get the ribbon to go around her kinky hair, but it wouldn't. She needed a relaxer. Rue threw the ribbon in the sink and took a deep breath. Every week she asked her mama for a relaxer only to be shot down. God gave you that pretty nappy head, so why would you want to ruin it? Probably because riches didn't hire nappy headed colored girls to work in the world of beauty. She bent down to the white tiled floor and applied light pressure to one octagon tile in the corner by the sink. Slender fingers slipped under the small gap and pried the ceramic lid up, her little secret since she was five. Papa had never gotten around to fixing the bathroom floor, no matter how much her mama had nagged him. Her, <coughs> Sorry. her job in Adola sat half empty. She had stolen it from the corner store a couple of weeks ago. The store clerk knew her family very well and Rue didn't want him telling her mama about her buying the cream. Twisting the cap off the glass jar, Rue scraped the fluffy white cream out and rubbed it on her face. 
pieces of her brown skin peeked out from beneath the concoction. She took more and rubbed it on her face again, covering all the unpleasant spots. Not seeing results, she wondered if it was working. Was she not using it right? Did she need to add more? The package had said, see, result see results in just two weeks. Yet here she was, as black as ever. Maybe she needed a stronger cream. LaRue and Nettle. The jar slipped from her hand, almost hitting the ground, but she snapped it up before it shattered. You ain't the only person in this house. You got 60 seconds to get out of the bathroom. Her mama's voice boomed through the home. Rue closed the jar and placed it back in her secret hiding spot. She grabbed the ribbon, placed it next to the lightning cream and replaced the tile. What you be doing in there that takes so long in the bathroom? Thelma asked. The warm April rays have vaporized the morning dew from the grass, leaving the air sticky. Thelma and Rue had about a good three blocks to walk to school. None of your concern, Thelma. You need to learn how to stay out of grown folks' business. Rue shifted her umbrella to block the sun more. And it's, what are you doing? Not whatever foolishness you said. She couldn't risk having the cream getting burnt off by the hot Georgian sun. Thelma snorted and rolled her eyes. You ain't grown. You like a year older than me. So if you're grown, then I'm grown. She placed her hands in the pockets of her new cigarette pants, mint green paired with the lavender blouse. The color complemented her tawny skin and curvy figure. Rue wore a basic navy A-line skirt with a basic white blouse to hide the fact that she was built like a front side of an ironing board. Well, I'm a woman, unlike you, who is still a child. Rue arched her back and stood up straight. She gave a condescending glance down to at her sister. Right. They walked in silence for a bit, swatting the mosquitoes away. Rue was glad for the break. She couldn't talk to her sister about what she was going through. She just wouldn't understand. Rue had tried to talk to her once, at, once after Thelma accepted a date from the guy that Rue liked. She'd been there when, she, when he'd asked. Rue saw the way he looked at her sister and the way he looked right through Rue like she didn't even exist. After dinner, she brought up that she felt ugly and that it was probably because she wasn't as light as her. Thelma sat in silence for a moment. I don't think that's true. I think that you're prettier than me. You may think that, but others don't. Dad doesn't, Uncle Troy doesn't, Grandpa didn't. Have you seen the women the men marry in our family? She didn't even give Thelma a chance to answer before she continue. No, you haven't. Y'all look the same. Since then, if Rue brought it up, she would just get an earful, earful about how she was, was beautiful, just how God made her. And she shouldn't try to mess with the Lord's creations. She knew that, that Thelma meant well, but this was the one aspect of her life she would never quite understand. The Lord messed up with Rue and she was planning on fixing it. You think we have, we're gonna have to do any more of those duck and cover drills, Thelma asked last, Asked. Last time I dropped so fast, I got a nasty brew on my knee. Rue took a deep sigh before answering her baby sister. We need to be prepared if the commies attack. I know it's stupid, but I'd personally rather be safe than sorry. They started the drills last month and since then had done one every few days. It was stupid. The likelihood of the commies dropping a bomb in the middle of nowhere, Georgia was minimal but Mrs. Jones said it was their patriotic duty. The schools loomed up ahead of them as they entered what, they didn't, what was in the colored part of downtown. It was really just a street though. The white downtown was the next street over. The school was small, A-frame building behind an even smaller A-frame building, K through six in the front, seven through 12th in the back. Rue and Thelma stood on the sidewalk and patiently waited for the few cars in town to ride past lazily. They entered the street and made their way across the two, two lane road. Did you know, did you do the, wow, 
Did you do the arithmetic homework? I still don't understand. Thelma was cut off by the squealing of tires. The front of a Ford pickup stopped inches from Rue, causing her skirt to fly up. Rue stood there, sure something had hit her, and was waiting to see the pearly gates of heaven. You planning on just standing there, nigger? A harsh voice came from the bed of the truck. Rue opened her eyes and saw five sets of white eyes staring at her. You should have ran them over, Tom, seeing if they just turned into skid marks on the road. The nasally laughter of the teen boys assaulted Rue's ears. During the commotion, Rue had dropped her books and proceeded to pick them up. Thelma helped to make the process move along faster as the driver revved their engine, inching towards the front, inching the truck forward. Her notes were scattered about and they hustled to get them in some semblance of order so that, so that they could flee the embarrassing scene. Rue couldn't believe this was happening. Rue had whipped up as the bang of the truck door slamming as Tom stood by and watched as Rue grabbed the remaining few pages off the asphalt. Watch where you were walking next time. Would be a shame if something happened to you. Rue stood there, frozen in place. He had spoken to her. The words had left his mouth and were di directed at her. He was worried about her safety. Thelma all but dragged Rue across the street and back onto the sidewalk. The pickup raced away. Rue took her seat in class. It was the third seat in the third row, not too far as to seem uninterested in her lessons, but not too close to seem like a know-it-all. It gave Mrs. Jones the illusion that Rue was an attentive student who took comprehensive notes. While almost, while almost getting hit by the car had shaken her up, Rue was still flustered by the fact, at the fact that Tom had even spoken to her. Tom had been the one for, for her since he stepped, wow. Tom had been the one for her ever since she stepped out, step, stopped the McLean twins from throwing rocks at her when they were 10. Told them that if they were gonna throw rocks, they should hit something or don't throw them at all. Since then, she had noticed a small glances her way. Tom's father was the mayor of Warrensville which is how he and Rue ran into each other so frequently. Throughout the multiple parades, ribbon cuttings, speeches, and of course, election years, they would eye each other. Tom stood alongside his father and Rue in the crowd. He thought about them running away from this place, starting small in Atlanta and working at Riches, her at the beauty counter, him in the men's store. They wouldn't be there for long. Tom would follow in his father's footsteps and eventually become governor of Georgia, and she would be right there beside him. Rue had journal upon journal filled with these types of features. She scribbled this one in the margins of her notebook. She took the occasional notes, like today. Mrs. Jones had been hinting at a geography test for the past week, and Rue didn't want to be caught off guard. In between the scrawling down the lists of all the state's capitals, she could overhear some guys behind her talking about in semi-hushed tones. I'm gonna ask them with the prom. Not if I get to her first, one chuckled. It don't matter, because ain't no way in hell Mr. Nettles letting her out of, out of sight with either of you. Who said I was gonna ask permission? I'm just trying to see what she's hiding under those pretty little skirts of hers. Chances are, if one of you's ass out, Thelma, the other one's had to ass out, has to go out with Rue. There was a noticeable pause as Rue felt their eyes burning into her back. She tried to ignore them and focus on whatever Mrs. Jones was rambling about. Oh, hell no. Nah. Ain't no way in hell I'm asking Roach out. You take her out, you have to lose her at night. This time, the boys cannot suppress their laughter. They burst out into side-splitting fits of hysteria. Shh. Rue turned quickly and glared at three collaborators. I'm trying to hear what Mrs. Jones is saying, if you do not mind. She was trying to turn back, but stopped herself. And for the record, I would never go to prom with the likes of you. You three monkeys are darker than me. Rue snickered and turned to face the board. The three of you are darker than me. He mocked, newsflash, black bitch. None of us wants your sorry ass. 
Everyone in this class knows that Thelma is the only nettle worth asking to prom. The tallest of the boy has raised his voice so everyone could hear. Ruth shifted uncomfortably as the eyes of the class turned to look at her. So drop the act, cause you ain't white. You ain't never gonna be white. Cause all you will, cause all you will ever be is a roach, roach. The room stayed deathly silent as they all sat with what he just said. Rue saw the boys' smug faces looking at hers. She saw one of the boys shrink in on himself, saw him trying to reconcile what was happening with who he was and failing, saw him decide to do nothing to save himself, and Rue didn't blame him. She turned and saw Thelma give her a look of pity. Tears welled up in her eyes. You will apologize to Rue now. Mrs. Jones' voice was soft, yes, yet firm. One tear fell and then another and another and another until the whole room became a wet blur. Rue couldn't do this, not here. She wiped. She wiped the sleeve of the navy sweater she had brought on her face to soak up the moisture. She couldn't let them see her cry. She threw her books in her bag and jetted out of the room. A hand pulled her, almost making her fall backwards. Sorry, mumble, mumbled Thelma as she tried to study Rue. The pitiful look in her eyes caused a wave and a miss anger to well up in Rue's chest. How dare she look at her like that? What would she understand about what just happened? She got all the fucking play in school with her pretty hair and light eyes and bright skin. She didn't have the right to pity Rue. Get off of me, Rue shoved, shoved Thelma. Rue, they're just stupid boys. Don't pay them no mind. The, the tenderness of Thelma's hand on Rue's shoulder infuriated her further. Come back to class. I'll give them the what for. Before Rue could register what her body was doing, her hand slapped the gentle smile off Thelma's face, a red spot where Rue's hand had landed. Rue brought her hand up and covered her mouth. What had she done? She hit her own sister, the only person who had ever been there for her. She watched Thelma take a step back and touch the red welt that, that was appearing on her cheek. I'm, I'm. Rue tried to find the words to fix this, but she couldn't. So she ran. So, well, there's that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aaliyah. Um, wonderful passage. Incidentally, that's one of my favorite stories in her collection. Um, it has like, one or two really horrifying twits in there and you guys should read it. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so now we're moving on to Navdeep Singh, Dylan, and let me pull up his introduction. Um, I'm happy to introduce to the audience the very witty Navdeep Singh, Dylan. He is the author of Sunny G's series of Rash Decisions, looks like this. Um, he is an adjunct professor of creative writing and English literature at Borough of Manhattan Community College in New York City. He holds an MFA in creative writing from California State University Fresno. He also holds a postgrad degree from the City University of New York Writers Institute and is a graduate of Voices of Our Nation Fiction Workshop. Born in England, Raised in Tanzania, Nigeria, Dubai, and Fresno, California, he is a Punjabi boy at heart. When he isn't writing or reading, he is obsessed with Bhangra, Bollywood, faking, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, jiu and cosplaying across the fandoms with his two nerdy kids. I want to add that reading Sunny G's series of rest decisions took me back to my days of being a teenager in Fresno, wondering, what am I doing here in Fresno anyway? The humor and weirdness and chaos in the story, the underlying grief and tension, the complicated brotherly love and resentment, resentment Sunny feels for his dead brother is perfectly captured to the earnest, confused, big-hearted gaze of the main character. It's a book that made me laugh and cry, and I am so happy to present to you Navdeep Singh Dillon. Navdeep Singh uh, Dillon. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Th thank you so much. Uh, that was a really wonderful um, uh, introduction. And um, uh, a big thank you to Jefferson for all the support from our MFA days all the way to, um, to now. And um, I'm uh, very excited to be um, introducing everyone to uh, Sunny G. 
Um, he's the star of my YA contemporary, um, Sunny G series of rash decisions. He's this um, very super nerdy cosplay and crochet and Bollywood obsessed Punjabi 16, who's trying to figure himself out while uh, dealing with grief and an uncertain post high school future, much like um, me and um, you know, I'm sure plenty of other people. Hope hopefully, hopefully, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll knock on wood there. Okay, so I'm going to read um, uh, the opening chapter, and we'll see. Uh, hopefully, I can get through most most of it and be a lot of time. For me. The life fantastic. You ever look in the mirror and think to yourself, "I look fantastic." My face, my nose, my eyes, the blonde streak in my hair, my body, these clothes, everything is lit. Yep, me neither. I'm in the gender neutral bathroom at prom where an alarming number of people are not washing their hands. I'm staring at my phone, unable to commit to pressing the add to story button on this post. I hit delete and take more photos from several different angles, experimenting with various facial expressions ranging from, oh, I didn't see you there, to I am Sunny Gill, rebranded, hear me roar. It's a little jarring looking at this new face in the mirror. I've been in here for eight minutes and counting, trying to regroup. I was ready to do this thing, make this my big night. Then I find Stefan sitting front and center at the table I was randomly assigned to. Of all people, it had to be him, the dude who made my life a fucking nightmare from seventh grade on, so I bolted straight to the bathroom, and now I'm reassessing all the grooming choices I've made since Thursday, including the bronze streak I had added at Supercuts, hoping for a bit of whimsy. It's not that I don't like this new face. It just feels like a stranger staring back at me. The beard and turban gone, replaced by gelled up wavy shoulder length hair. My beard was never a sexy Jason Momoa as Aquaman beard, or wild and dangerous like Daffy the Feebles from the Jamie Snollygoster series, me and Ngozi are obsessed with. Not as cool as my brother Goldie's manicured designer daddy with the twirled up mustache or as intimidating as the rough bristles of Papa's salt and pepper beard. But it was uniquely mine. A sparse soft layer of black sprinkled on my, over my cheeks. Almost all of the older warriors and sorcerers in Jamie Snolly Gloucester have beards, a sign of wisdom and courage, hard won from a lifetime of wielding magic and battling back. Or maybe they don't have time for grooming. A good 10 pages of book one was spent on the first years contemplating their future beards. That's what initially drew me to Daffet, his magnificently wild, I don't care beard. The summer before ninth grade, I made the transition from wearing a patka, the kid version of the turban, to the one adults wear, the pug or the star. I was excited. My beard was lightly coming in. I could recite a respectable number of bodies from the opening sacred composition of our holy scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib. I'd had enough of the childish Patka. I was ready to man up and claim the Dastan. Plus, Goldie thinks anyone who has a beard and is still wearing the Patka deserves all the ridicule they get. He calls it the thick toddler look. Before I committed, I spent hours researching turban style, watching sick TikTok stars, Punjabi singers, and vloggers on YouTube. I even uncovered some fun facts, for example, the word the star comes from the Farsi, thus they are, meaning the hand of the divine. And the word Dolban became turban thanks to the terrible pronunciation of the French and English. An eternal optimist, I thought I would glide on into my first day at Barstow High, the most badass ninth grader wearing dollar store sunglasses, a turquoise the star tied patiali shy style. I walked in with the swagger of a Punjabi singer or Bollywood star ready to defend the honor of his girl family village with a dramatic preamble before unleashing the supper of pain, hashtag TTP. I had high hopes, no more bullying, reverence, or girls swooning. It took one terrorist comment from Stefan to unravel it all. I wish I had Papa's confidence. His plug has always been one style that takes me 10 minutes to tie it. Mildly creased and pointed, super wide and loose. Hair is one of the fundamental outward physical characteristics of being a sick. And the one that Papa says is the easiest to do. You don't have to do anything. Let nature take its course. My brother Goldie, his confidence is on another level. Never a planner, no research, no watching turban tying tutorial, nothing. Probably woke up every morning and rocked whatever turban style he felt like. For his prom, he wore a ridiculous silk teal peacock to start, 
he got drunk that night and needed me, his little brother, to once again cover for him. Yet he's the one Mama and Papa talk about like he is the most amazing son that ever existed. My hand instinctively pats the journal inside my bright orange and red skull on fire crocheted pouch, part of my daffod the feeble cosplay. BG, my grandmother, and I sell the pouches, among other things, on Loom the Fandom, our Etsy store. Technically, the store is on Etsy. That's where you have to go to actually buy things. But my social media business presence is on Instagram, where I answer questions and post pics. The pouches do pretty well. You'd be surprised by how many people design amazing pocketless costumes and forget to make matching accessories. The mark of a beginning cosplayer. Kick-ass cosplay ruined by a fucking tote bag from Trader Joe's. My pouch is a lifesaver. It holds all my manly essentials. Breath, mint, uh, breath mints, hand sanitizer, phone, money, card, a small set of keys, and of course, Goldie's journey, which is kind of mine now. I'm glad nobody else from our Bramblecore heavy metal band, Unkempt, is here, because they would all be taking shifts telling me how anti-canon it is to wear my crocheted pouch without a kilt or armor, especially in Gozi, my best friend and the lead singer. She thinks she gets to say in everything about my life. Do I get a say in hers? Not bloody likely. She's British, says weird shit like that all the time. But when I say anything, suddenly it's, Sonny, you plonker, leave it out, Sonny, which are not even legit British events. They're from some obscure Brit TV show she and her mum watch. Every year, me and, me and Gozi and the rest of Unkempt play at the Snollygloster Soiree, an annual shindig dedicated to the world of Jamie's Snollygloster. Even though Jamie has millions of fans and is a star of the Snollygloster series, me and Gozi never like the entire plotter. Maybe he just reminds us of Stefan with his jokes about people's weight and the way they speak. Or perhaps it's that Jamie couldn't just sit his ass down and memorize some fucking spells instead of looking for illuminated maps by opening doors nobody told him to open. Plenty of other fans feel the same way, which is why the heavy metal bramble core subgenre is even a thing. Me and Ngozi immediately love the two minor characters, Daffod and Safia Brambleberry, father and daughter sorcerers who lived at the unnamed tavern just outside the grounds of Malmesbury Academy. We started writing about them in our fan fiction, which quickly turned into songs. We both felt like Safia should have been the real hero of the books anyway. Aside from his beard, I like Daffin because he was a solid friend to Jamie and loyal, like tragically loyal, even shady ass people who had a vendetta against him. And he didn't give a shit when people tried to ridicule him for only owning one style of armored cloak for every occasion. Soirees, battles, serving meat at the tavern, unbothered. The way I pretend to be online and wish I were in real life. I look up at my face in the mirror and sigh. It would be nice if Ngozi had just come here to normal prom but she definitely won't. This is as far from her scene as you can get. There's no way she would stand for this dress code, which has no restrictions on what the boys wear, but the girls can't even show their shoulders or ankles like we're in Victorian England. Still, I wish she were here, even if she was scowling silently at the table, mocking the suit I'm wearing and my face. Maybe I should text her. Ngozi just doesn't understand that this year, I want to do something different, that there's a world of magical possibilities, even here at normal prom. She probably thinks I'm here because of a girl, but alas, there is no girl. Just a lifetime of watching rom-coms in Hindi, Punjabi, and English. I wish there was someone I could make a grand declaration of love to, but it's just me and my Penhai, AKA Axed, Terminal. Like Ngozi, like Ngozi is one to talk anyway, She's just as awkward around girls as I am, but she's hardly the only one annoyed with me tonight. I'm also supposed to be at home for Goldie's birthday, marking the anniversary of his death, like he'll miss me or something. Everyone is constantly telling me what I'm supposed to be doing. Goldie made it out of Fresno, fucked it all up, and now he's gone. And even though Mama and Papa have never said anything, there's no way I can leave now. They probably definitely expect me to stay in Fresno for the rest of my life under their watchful eye. I don't even like alcohol. The smell, the taste, the idea of not being in control of your own body and thoughts, no thank you. Even in death, Goldie manages to be a dark stinking cloud looming over my head. Goldie's the reason I'm here at Normal Prom in the first place, kind of. A few months ago, I found this notebook behind the bookshelf in his room, a journal from when he was at rehab. It was a real mess, kind of like his approach to life, unorganized, completely unfettered by, 
consequences, reaping all the benefits. I loosen the tassels and flip open the pouch. I remove the notebook and look intently at it. When I found it, I recovered it with a simple crochet sleeve using three different colored wools, teal, green, and yellow. You can still see Goldie's original tattered cover underneath, a picture of a peacock with faded teal feathers. I flip through the notebook, hoping something insightful will suddenly come tumbling out, but it's the same as it was when I first found it. Inside is pure chaos. Some journal entries, blank pages, doodles, artwork, random poems, words in large letters. My eyes land on the word Rahal, which I learned about at Khalsa school. It means to pause and think deeply about the central message of a Shabbat, a sacred musical poetic composition. On a blank page, after all his gibberish, I've written out a heading for a new list, Sunny G's series of rash decisions. It comes right after Goldie's final almost entry, Goldie's list of ways to be a better Jew, dated a few days before he died. But no actual list accompanies it, just blank pages upon blank pages, a sea of nothingness. The finality of the blank pages kind of freaked me out. That's why I started the rash decisions list. No more obedient Sonny G, who does whatever everyone tells him to do. Time for Sonny to make reckless life choices. The first and so far only entries in my rash decision notebook. Number one, change face. Two, go to prom. I close up the notebook and place it back in my pouch. I look at the draft of the Insta post on my phone. Creating hashtags and captions is much easier for my Lean the Fandom account. Those I can come up with in seven seconds flat. They're usually inspirational quotes, along with a photo of something I crocheted available for purchase. The latest, a cup of masala cha wearing a crocheted tea cozy, sunset in the background, the caption. Don't just let life pass you by wondering what if, be the if. I'm fucking profound on social. But I need a better shot for my personal Insta. I pause and lean over my sink, angling my chin upward, that's when I notice it, an out of place nose hair. Things quickly spiral out of control because it goes like this. You notice the nose hair, you destroy said nose hair and think that's the end of it, but there's a plot twist, more nose hairs. You question whether these really are new or they've been here this entire time. You realize the futility of destroying them all after the fourth one. By then your eyes are a watery mess making it look like you've been crying five fucking minutes into prom. Blasted nose hairs. I make another attempt at selfie, pinching two fingers together to zoom in close. I gasp as I notice my meatloaf size sideburns. I don't remember why I thought it would be a good idea to do them myself. They look uneven. Am I overthinking? Perhaps it's my posture, I rationalize. I cover my face with my thumb and index, like there's a secret carpenter's level pulsing through my veins. Sure enough, the results are clear. Fresno, we have a problem. One sideburn is slightly lopsided. I notice the nose hairs again, like arrows being shot from my nostril army of archers. I consider chucking them back inside, but what if I sneeze? Or there's like a gust of wind, just as I'm saying something super insightful. I'll tell you what, it will send all those nose hairs tumbling out and I will become a meme, that's what. I glance back at this new draft. I look like a dude carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. I type, time for, time for prom. Hashtag sunny at prom, awesome time, prom bathroom selfie. New face, who this? We did it. I zoom in close on my phone camera. My hair is a mess. This angle makes it look like it's been elf locked, even though it's tangle free. I could use one of Safia Brambleberry's spells right now, even though Ngozi thinks the whole idea of an anti frizz hair enchantment is some white supremacy bullshit. Mama would probably just tell me to use baking soda and vinegar on my hair. She thinks those two things alone can fix all the world's problems. Hair straightener, beard regrower, oven cleaner, skin exfoliator, Toilet bowl, bowl freshener. If mama were a doctor, instead of working at the video store, I bet 90% of her remedies would involve baking soda and vinegar. The other 10% would be turmeric, which she always cooks with. It is antiseptic, she says. We should always be prepared for calamity. Baking soda, vinegar, turmeric, nuts, and spilling the latest tea in Bollywood. Those are the things me and mama talk about. We don't talk about Goldie, not even in euphemisms. You'd think a year would be enough time to accept that my brother is gone, to learn to start using the past tense. I still feel a lump in my throat when I use the words that feel so final, dead. 
death, cremation, alcoholic. No more playing video games with my brother, getting yelled at for following him around everywhere. It's just so definitive, gone. The bathroom door flings open I can, and I can feel my left buttock twitch before I even see him. Chisel white boy face, Stefan. That's what Ngozi and I call him because he looks like the Eurocentric vision the Echo, Evie Boyle, probably had in mind when she described Jamie Smolikov just facing the books. They had never seen a boy so handsome. His cheeks were chiseled as though the gods themselves had come down to do the work, his nose slender and ending at an angle. Lips as red as roses, a beautiful, sharp, dimpled chin. Our beloved series has got plenty of problems. That's the reason we started writing fan fiction in the first place. Stefan doesn't look all that. His dimpled chin looks more like a chin with two butt cheeks, trying real hard to pretend they're not butt cheeks. But he does have that face that they love to cast on TV shows, the hazy blue eyes and pale skin, like he hunts vampires in his spare time. He uses the phrase Jai Chi non-ironically, thinks of telling racist jokes about a variety of, make, uh, of races makes him an equal opportunity offender, not just racist squared. He brushes past me, handles his business, then sidles up next to me and turns on the faucet. My face is still turned upward from the nostril viewing, and I'm frozen there so as not to look like a doofus, and in so doing, feel like a much bigger doofus. Of the million universal nerdy things he could mock me for, he always goes for the lazy racism, with geographically and culturally inaccurate jabs that have surprisingly not gotten more complex over the years. Five years in, and it's still terrorist ISIS jihad, with plenty of microaggressions thrown in. You'd think I'd have some comebacks by now. You'd be wrong. I'm ready for the blow, but he just checks himself out in the mirror as he lathers up his hands, rinses them off, then shakes his head in annoyance at something on the wall as my face lowers to a normal elevation. Hand dryers, man, he says, catching me off guard. I suck my teeth at the hand dryer like he's been talking shit about my family and then he held deeply in an attempt to avoid stuttering. Spreads more germs than paper towels. I watch Stefan's face to see if he noticed the stutter. But what are you going to do, I add, like I'm a gangster from the 1940s? Can't wipe your hands on your pants. The sound of the hand dryer stops. He laughs. See you back at the table. I nod as he makes his way out of the bathroom. Surreal. I have never had an encounter with Stefan that didn't involve some kind of humiliation. My very first interaction with Stefan was in seventh grade when we had to introduce ourselves, which is a really stressful activity for any kid, double for a kid who stutters and looks the way I do. And then Stefan happened. I was in the middle of stuttering on the first syllable of my name when Stefan muttered, to terrorist, and some of the other kids started laughing, which completely threw me off and I started stuttering like a machine that's short circuiting until the teacher interrupted me finished my sentence and told me to sit down. In high school, it evolved into a cruel strategy just for laughs, where Stefan would constantly interrupt me just to make me stutter and feel like shit. He made school hell. I got a little reprieve when Ngozi entered the picture in the middle of ninth grade, bringing along all kinds of other things, the Jamie Snollygoster series, the joy of fan fiction and the bramble core heavy metal theme that we discovered together. I take a deep breath and exhale as quietly as I can. I hate that I'm so predictable, but those days are behind me now. And in a few weeks, all of this is going to be over. Maybe this plan is working after all. I wash my hands. As the hairdryer loudly spreads germs all over them again, I feel a giddiness. Is this what happy feels like? As I exit the bathroom, I finish up my post. Sometimes I write a caption. You've got to stop saying Fres no and start saying Fres yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Navdeep. That was so great. <laughs> that was a great first chapter. All right. So um, we are moving on to the Q&A now. And if you are in the audience, you can post a question in the chat, I believe. And we'll, you know, uh, we'll address it. I believe you cannot unmute yourself, so I think it might have to be in the chat. If not, I do have a, a few questions on hand, but it's, you know, great for audience engagement if we do have questions from the audience too. 
Um, but we'll go on and, you know, again, if you have questions, please post. Um, okay. So I was curious, and I want to ask you about your writing too, but I was actually curious about like how you got your book covered. Because I feel like um, I feel like that's a, a mysterious part of the the, the writing, um, the publishing process that I don't, I don't understand yet. So I was just curious, and, and your covers are so beautiful too. Um, so maybe Aaliyah could start and then Nafdeep can continue. Yeah, um, but my book cover was the I'm not gonna lie it was the last thing in like the forefront of my mind going through the publishing process and then all of a sudden I got an email from my editor being like here's an artist redemption of some book covers what tell us what you want and I looked at them and they were okay but they didn't really seem to fit with the like the themes of the book and I ended up talking to the artists and I said you know I really want to focus on, you know, I don't want a lot of things happening on the book <laughs> at all. And she said, okay, I got it. And then she went out and she took a photo of like a conglomeration of roots on a tree by her home. Yeah. And then she said, did some Photoshop. He said, does this work for you? And I said, yeah. I said, I got our five minute conversation <laughs> worked. So, so yeah. Yeah, it was just like a nice little back and forth with the, the cover artist. Thank you. How about you, Nadi? Yeah, that, that, that's actually really interesting that you got to talk to the, the cover artist. So um, my, so like, I, I really like this cover. It's very, it's very like um, uh, pretty. Yeah, thank you. And so um, my, my, my book actually got delayed because of the cover. So um, they, they, had like so it was originally supposed to come out last uh, last year and they had they had i thought it was a is a nice cover it was like a lot quieter there's a scene in sunny where they're eating um um mong sausage and they're at the flea, flea market and uh, so they had that it was a lot quieter of a, of a cover it's more like a like a drama kind of um cover uh so uh, it was actually ready to go and then they um and then the marketing department rejected it and so they needed to work on it a bit more so then they started with this and it, it was actually pretty collaborative. I think every every writer has different experiences with the cover, uh, but it was it was quite collaborative. So like so, for example, like this, my 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 daughter, she's just twelve now. Her 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 note was on on uh, Mindy's shoes. She originally had uh, like these high heel shoes, and my daughter was like, "Why on earth would she have high heel shoes in Fresno when it's really dusty and she's on a motorbike?" So they changed it to combat boots. So that, the, the, this is like the only note that I had on this. It was just literally the boots. That was literally it. So it, it was a pretty seamless process on, on this, uh, this last cover. All right, thank you so much. I was just curious. Um, okay, so here's a question for Aaliyah. Um, the story you read had such intensity, swung from humor to fierce anger so quickly. How do you navigate that range of intensity within one story? That's a great question. Um as I'm currently a residency right now and navigating it through another story, um, I learned lots of mimosas, but, but honestly speaking, it, it's one of those things where I think that I, I handle my own personal grief and despair um, through an anger through humor and trying to process it that way, that it, kind of overflows into my writing um i i think that when my writing gets too heavy um at one moment i i get sad and i don't want to write it and i feel like other people might not want to read that so i tried to break it up and make it as light that as as it feels appropriate does that make sense <laughs> yeah <laughs> um Okay, Erica has a question too, so I'll just read it out loud. So both of you have such strong characters that matches well with the conflict. What comes first for you when starting a story? Your character, a piece of dialogue, a plot point. Also a great question, Erica, thank you. Um, sorry, we'll have, we'll have Nazi maybe start. Sure, sure. sure. Uh, okay, so uh, I feel like mine mine was like a, a real jumble, like I, uh, like my, uh, I know a lot of people that really outline like things before they even get started on 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 the story. I I have to have my character 
um, so it and, and just at least like um, uh, kind of a premise, uh, which I I like I, I would love it if I could actually work out the plot before I get started. That would, it would eliminate a lot of a lot of hassle on my end. But I need to like because for me like character and plot are kind of entwined. Uh, like I need to know where the story is taking place and then how that affects the the character. For for example, like with with Sunny. Um, it it started it started off as just like um, this um, you know this nerdy brown kid um, who's just having issues and trying to figure out his identity, and then as soon as I said it in Fresno, then I started integrating my own experiences, and then it became a lot heavier of a story. Before it was it was probably going to be a very like rom com, and then of course I I got in my own way and I made it uh, much more complicated than I needed it to be. But yeah, it's usually like char character and uh, story uh, a plot. Sometimes a piece of dialogue as well is kind of a fun, fun way to like. It's just sort of floating around. So it's, it's like a big mess uh, to 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 put the question, uh, to answer the question. But <laughs> yeah, um, I'll say that for me, uh, it's like I just it's like catching a sentence. Um, I'll sit in front of a blank screen and like I'm like I'm gonna write something. I have no idea what's going to happen within the next five minutes. And I literally just write the first sentence that comes into my, that pops into my brain. And then I just go from there until I can't go anymore because I'm so confused. I don't know who these people are, are or where the plot is going or what the setting, what's happening, what's taking place. And then from there, I go back and I try to figure out who, who these characters are and what stories are they trying to tell. Um, but I think a really big part of my process is just listening to what's happening around me or in the universe, <laughs> in the spirit realm, and then just just catching it as it like flits by and putting it on page. That's awesome. Thank you two for sharing. They're like, you know, different answers, but so fascinating. All right, um, let's, so here's another question for Navdeep. Uh, love your reading voice, reading your book, then hearing yeah. you bring it to life felt so fun. How do you maintain such a velocity in the protagonist's voice? That's a really good question. Oh, that that's a great question. Um, so vo voice is one of those things that is um, that I, I I really get drawn to when uh, as a reader. Um, I really love um, uh, a strong voice. Like if if the voice is strong, I will read anything. Like even if it's outside of what I would normally read. Uh, when I was writing um, Sunny A, I have like a massive playlist. I've got songs. I've got things to get me in kind of the the mood of the of the story because like there are some that are kind of uh it's kind of similar to what 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 uh what you were talking about with handling like grief and the intensity um uh where 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 you know where where if it gets too overwhelming you don't want to even write the scene like you, you wouldn't want to read the scene you don't want to write the scene so it's it's similar to that so i have um uh, so you know so i've got i've got those moments and and the music kind of helps to get me in that headspace uh, to to write the scenes that I want to without it it completely changing the um, you know I think velocity is a good way to to put it without changing changing all of that. Thank you. Um, we have another question here for both of you. What part of the book was most fun to write? So maybe we'll go to Leah and then Nafdeep. Um, the book, <laughs> the part of the book that was most fun to write. Um, I would say was the short story, um, The Wives of Friendly Creek. Um, I, I don't know, it was just a fun short story to write and I don't play with form a lot or structures and stories. So it was, it, it was nice to be able to do that and not have like the pressure of being like, this has to be perfect. It was just nice to play around for a bit. I, I had a, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Hey, no, no, I, uh, yeah. Good um, So for me, um, I, I had a lot of fun um, with quite a few of the chapters, but one of my favorite ones was um, I, I gave like a cameo to my my two kids, and of course they completely outgrew the the fandom that I put them in because they they were really into like um, you know whatever the certain fandom was, uh, and the other part was. Um, uh, the library. I uh, I spent a lot of time at the Henry Madden Library, so I included that. I had a little cameo uh, there, so it, it was a lot of fun, uh, including those things. Okay, we have another question from Erica. Um, what did you edit out of the book? 
That's a really good question too. Um, we'll go with Aaliyah and then I'll keep again. Um, what did I edit out of the book? Um, I edited a whole story out of the book. <laughs> Yeah, um, there was just a story that I was like, I really want to put it in, and I love it so much. And my editor, God bless her, looked at me and she said, "It's just not gonna fit in it." <laughs> and she said, "Maybe you can use it for something else, but it doesn't fit narratively with the themes of this collection." And ultimately, she was right. Um, and that was like the hardest edit to do, but it is definitely what I took out. I edited um, Harry Potter out of my story, which is what the original premise was. You, I'm sure you can tell the, the sort of the, the fandom is, is there. And um, it, was, I, it, it was a pretty big change because it was like the entire premise, like um, uh, Sonny's supposed to be cosplaying Hagrid. Uh, that, that was his, the original concept of it. And, um, and then, then, then like the author started going off the rails. Like for, first it was like, you know, a little bit and, then she completely went off, and, and then I, I didn't feel comfortable writing the story. I didn't really want to write, write into it, and it was all the way at like the copy editing stage, um, which is where you're just supposed to like fine tune the commas and periods and spelling. And then I had to like I completely dismantle the entire thing, so um, uh, so it was, so I had to like create a brand new fandom, and I created like a whole map, like I'm some fantasy author that's got like. And for, for like three sentences or something though, about like the Sony Gluster um, series. But uh, and there, there was a lot of other like jokes and things that I had to sort of um, revamp and, and things like that. Wow, thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, each of you came to your book deals in different ways. Aaliyah, I think yours had, may have come from the lead in a previously published story and update yours is such a major label. Could you each of you talk about how did that develop for you? Oh, sorry, we'll go with Aaliyah again. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not good. Um, I actually um, only have the one short story published separately. And then I, I went on like what I call a submission binge where I was just <laughs> submitting things any and everywhere. And I, for, I forgot that I had submitted this manuscript to a manuscript recall. Um, and I got an email like three months later, three months after I got the email being like, we want to publish you. And then I emailed her back being like, are you sure? Yeah. And she was like, yeah. And I was like, okay. So it's, it's a very small publishing press. I think it, me and three other uh, folks are like the first books in this, for this press. So it was a very intimate, like, publishing process um more intimate than what i thought it was going to be so it was it was nice it was a really nice and smooth process for sure um so i actually went through um a book packaging uh company so it was um so it was, it was kind of a uh you know an interesting process because uh when i was first approached it was for um uh, it, it was for like a lighthearted um, story, and uh, then then of course I I integrated a lot more things into it, and and, and I actually had a lot more control with this because um, usually book packaging company they they have the idea and they just want you to write it. Uh, it like they've outlined the entire thing and they want you to write it. This one I had a lot more um, leeway with it, so I was able to um, to build that, and then then it, it was sent out to you know several places. Um, and then so somebody at Penguin, um, I, you know, they really got what the book was trying to do. And, um, uh, and I got this great editor who, who really guided that, that uh, story well, where, uh, as opposed to like, there were some others that were, um, you know, they wanted the story to be a little bit different than what I was um, going for. Um, so yeah, but so I got that. And now, I'm, now it's interesting because now, now I have to go back into the trenches and, and get an agent and go through the uh, the process um, uh, that I would normally have done. Well, that's super interesting. Thank you two for sharing. Um, okay, here's a question from Vanita. Hi, Vanita. Um, I had a problem late, sorry. Um, congrats to you both. I wanna know what you're working on now. 
Yeah, so yeah, that's also a question I had actually. Your upcoming projects or works? Uh, well, Aaliyah and Anoptic again. Um, I am currently working on a collection of short stories surrounding um, grief in like a more intense way than <laughs> I already do. Um, yeah, I think that uh, 2020 was a rough year. Um, coming into the program, I had just lost my grandmother. A couple years before that, I had lost my mom. On graduation day in 2020, I got the phone call that my father had passed. So like, I do a lot of car compartmentalizing up here. <laughs> so I was like, this has to come out some way. So I said, why not just work through it through a collection? So that's, that's what I've been working on for like the past couple months. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing the opposite. Like after uh, Sunny and dealing with them. Um, yeah, and like uh, after doing that and dealing with the grief and, and, and Sunny, uh, I wanted it to be, um, uh, I'm working on a, on a lighthearted um, story, which is what this was supposed to be. So I'm going back to that. It's a, it's a, it's a tractor love story. Um, so it's, um, it's got tractors, it's also going to be set in Fresno. I'm still working out the, um, the detail from that. All right. Thanks for sharing. So excited to like look up at your upcoming projects and works. Um, okay. I think we have time for one last question and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll let it, you know, go to the audience. If there's not one last question, I do have one last question. So, you know, your last chance. Okay. Um, I do have one, you know, uh, as, as, as writers of colors, right? Um, as writers of colors and we're writing characters and, and literary characters who are also people of color. Um, and, and we think about, you know, our place in the literary world and the literary landscape, right? And, and your characters are also exploring heritage and legacy, you know, Sani's questioning his, his family, his traditions, his culture. And Aaliyah, in your stories, like a lot of characters are also exploring their past and you know the past haunts you right and there's kind of hauntings in your stories too both of you but I guess my question is about like um I wrote it down let me look at it again um in telling your stories about characters who are not the typical mainstream characters to explore the idea of their heritage um so what kind of literary heritage do you hope your stories your characters might leave for readers I don't know maybe that's does that make sense? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, when, um, so I, I grew up as a, as a third culture kid where I, I, you know, I grew up in a ton of different countries that was very different to my birth country and uh, my parents' um, uh, culture. So uh, a lot of the books that I was reading were, um, they were pretty much all like, you know, white characters uh, and and I started writing when I started writing. That's where I started writing. Um, so I have a lot of empathy for my my students, like my creative writing students. Uh, when I first started teaching creative writing, um, uh, this is like in in in, uh, in New York, uh, where like uh, like places like you know the uh, people that would commute from the Bronx and stuff. So it was it was almost like uh, I would say like ninety percent they were like people of color. And every single one of them would write white characters in these adventurous stories because they'd never seen uh, people who look like them um, being the stars of the show. Uh, so I think it's very important to, to have that representation. Um, and and the, the, that was important to me where I, I have like a whole, you know, cast of people who are uh, people of color going on this fun adventurous night and going through all that because, uh, you know, uh, because like sort of the the archetype is that um, it's it's a coming of age with with any of these stories where uh, you you have those, those those things and then you have the fun things and we're so used to seeing ourselves as the sidekick or the uh, you know the, the character that it doesn't really matter that that's that kind of gets into your your psyche and so I you know just to so when when we say you know use words like mainstream and normal and uh, those sorts of things it you know, it's not normal for a lot of people to see um, all white people uh, in their vicinity. Like when in the books that I was reading, um, when I when I was reading when I was reading these books all over the all over the world, um, I I would kind of be drawn to things that um, 
uh, like I was able to connect to all these like you know Russian writers and um, you know British writers that were writing about you know things like uh, you know Christmas ham, which I still really don't understand the you know the what exactly it is or you know macarons and macaroons and things like that, which I have a whole chapter on. Um, so I, I find like the unfamiliar is 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 interesting and it is universal um, in that way. Um. I, I think along a similar vein, um, I was reading a lot of fantasy and science fiction and horror, which are vastly white landscapes. And I it it I kept getting annoyed that I didn't see anyone that looked like me in those in those stories. So I and I also kept seeing like black characters in particular boxed into these very specific genres that I just was not interested in and in a, in a way that the genres had negative connotations around them and when I went to my very first grade writing class in college I got asked if I was writing urban fiction and I got, and I got confused and was like no I write fantasy and horror and then the look of shock <laughs> on on his face uh, was very telling and I and I realized that there was definitely a space for me to to carve out and to fill that I wanted to do um, so I want my stories out there for 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 folks of color and brown folks who want to be able to consume these types of genres and feel seen and represented in the culture that they find there.